Richard Holler at the Historic Grandin Theater is a live storytelling series that's the brainchild of Roanoker Lee Hunsaker. The theme for this episode is The Body. Tellers share tales of lost limbs, negative attitudes about our own bodies, and how to overcome medical and psychological adversity. Blue Ridge PBS Echo is pleased to share these moving stories. Please note that the opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Blue Ridge PBS or the Echo Channel, and be advised that some of the stories contain graphic language and stories about mental and physical abuse, so viewer discretion is advised. All right, so our next teller is a first-time teller, which always equals the extra and the extra and the extra love. Um, the, <laughs> this man has made me cry a time or 12 um, with his beautiful soul. Um, and you're going to be able to feel that right away, but I won't spoil it. Um, he moved to Cave Spring two years ago with his husband from San Diego, California, where they lived for 30 years. Before that, he lived in Seattle, Washington for 15, and that is where his story tonight took place. This is his first time on the Hoot and Holler stage. I have pushed him, and I have pushed him. Um, some of you may know that I'm sometimes referred to as a story doula or midwife, and I, um, I hit the Pitocin on this guy, okay? I'm just... <laughs> so lean in with the love, y'all. Luke Terpstra. Thank you. That felt really good. It's, it feels great to be here. Look, Ma. My career as an orthopedic technician all started back in the senior year of high school. I answered an ad for a new training program at the large Catholic hospital in my hometown, hometown in Michigan. The training was to assist orthopedic surgeons in all types of bone fracture management, applying traction, applying casts, and assisting in surgery. I was accepted into the training program and fell in love with the work immediately. My early training and years of experience led me to my job at Children's Hospital in, Sandy, in Seattle, Washington. I worked at Children's for about five years in the 80s. <clears throat> I was a cast and brace technician in the birth defects clinic. And I would like to start out by reading a poem that was written for me by one of my patient's grandfathers. And the poem is entitled, Luke. A thousand men like Gunga Din, heroes of story ever told. But the heroes for me seldom you see or read about in headlines bold. Like one who works with children, by chance I came to know down at Children's Hospital, where my grandson has to go. Each day, Luke with trouble works, and sights are sometimes grim. There with hands both swift and sure, Luke works to help kids mend, ever chasing their fears away with the most impish of grins. So from my grandson and me, we both guarantee Luke's a hero, a man among men, by Harry Jacobson. And Harry's, <laughs> Harry's grandson, Adam, was one of my patients who had to have serial casting in preparation for surgery for untreated club foot. It was always Harry who brought Adam into the clinic, so we became good friends. This is a cartoon, a Larson cartoon, that I had in my cast room for many years. Let's get this baby off the ground. <laughs> it was a favorite. We treated a number of congenital defects, including spina bifida, hip dysplasia, and the common one was club foot. My job was to apply cast, serial casting to correct the deformities. 
Then while the plaster was setting up, I continued to mold correction into the foot. When the plaster was set up, they were good to go for two weeks. When they came back, and we did it all over again. The cast had to be removed with a cast saw, which was quite loud and created a lot of vibration. And I always told mom that the saw would only tickle, but the babies didn't like it a bit. The serial casting started when the baby, baby was about one week old, then changed every two weeks to accommodate their growth and to continue correcting the deformity. Normally, the children would come to the clinic for these serial casts, but in the event of severe deformity, I would go to University Hospital and start casting babies at about three days old before they went home. This is how they would start their lives, being tugged on, pried, manipulated, and stretched. I would, of course, be as gentle as possible, but many times they would look up at me as if to say, Really, dude, is all this necessary? <laughs> Little did they know that we would develop a close bond for the next two years. And another very important bond that was needed to be forged was with the parents and the siblings. I had to let them know that I was on their side and we were all in this together. They were scared and unsure and had many questions and concerns. I also needed their help to get through this. I needed them to hold and console the crying baby so we could get through the treatment. I had to be honest and thorough and kind. I needed them to trust me. And most of them were able to overlook my ponytail and earring. My cast room was large with five exam tables that were filled with babies, surrounded by moms and siblings, and was busy, noisy, and chaotic. I would introduce everyone to each other so they could see that there were different stages of treatment and exam visits, and that they were not alone. It was also very helpful for them to compare notes. We started with serial casting, and then at about six months, they would get corrective surgery. When they came back for their post-op exam, they would have two or three stainless steel pins sticking out of their forefoot that had to be pulled. And the best way to do this was by sneak attack. That is, tell mom what you're going to do, have her hold the baby while you grab the foot with one hand, and grab the pin with the pliers and pull. I know. <laughs> but when it was over, it was over, and it was like a pinch. They would be casted for another week or two, and then they would go into removable night splints, which made life a little easier, and they could get on with their next big steps, which we called ambulation. It would be a big deal when at around two years of age, they could throw those miserable night splints away. <laughs> and finish up this long, seemingly never-ending process. All these stages would be marked as milestones that we would celebrate with cheers and high fives. It was always mind-blowing watching them grow, learn, and develop their personalities. They weren't like other kids. They learned to read earlier. Their ABCs and numbers came sooner. To say nothing about coping, these kids could cope. We had stimulating conversations about how they would look out their windows to watch neighbor kids and siblings run and play with reckless abandon, and they would wonder, what would that feel like? We would talk about what they could do when people stared. Not just other children, but adults. 
and they wondered why adults did not have better manners. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I suggested that they ask the adults that if they have any questions to go along with their stares, that you would be happy to enlighten them. <clears throat> And quite often they were happy just to say, take a picture, it'll last longer. <laughs> one day I was talking to one of my patients, uh, an adorable young lady about five years old. And she was fascinated with a little gold pirate earring that I was wearing. And finally she said, are you gay or what? <laughs> And laughing, I said, you got me. <laughs> yes, I sure am gay. And she said, I knew it. <laughs> and her mother said, that's my daughter, five going on 20. <laughs> Children's Hospital encouraged staff to dress up for Halloween in some kind of a suitable costume to entertain the kids. One year, I dressed up as a witch doctor. I danced around their exam tables and shook a baby rattle, conjuring up some kind of magic spell. We laughed and laughed. Many friends would confide in me that they just couldn't work in such a sad and hopeless situation. And hopeless was not a word that I would ever use in the birth defects clinic. I found it to be just the opposite. The word I use is hopeful. Most of these kids had so much spirit and they picked up the cards that they were dealt and they played the game. Harry, whose poem I read earlier so eloquently said that I was a hero because of my work with crippled children. And while that means so much to me, I have to say that it was the children who are the heroes for their bravery and courage. Thank you. <laughs>